So Bobby George, founder of the IOTA chapter, one of the founders of the IOTA chapter yeah. <laughs> of, uh, of Pi Kappa Alpha, also known as Pike. He goes to Hamden Sydney College, NVA, and uh, he is the pledge educator. He will be graduating this year. He's also a member of the 29th Infantry Division. Thank you for your service, bro. Uh, glad to have you, man. I'm glad to be here. Thanks again. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things we really wanted to get into in this podcast is is just learn more about Greek life. And there's mm -hmm. so much in the movies, uh, on TV, the documentaries we see about hazing and the alcohol-filled parties. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've seen movies like Old School, for instance, where it's it's just like every person's dream to be in this, like, state of chaos and, uh, you know, surrounded by friends and booze. Um uh, what made you want to join the fraternity there at Hamden, Sydney? So uh, I grew up with two parents that were both uh, Greek, that are both Greek, rather. Uh, my father's a Sigma Chi, my mother's a Pi Beta Phi, and they're very, very loyal to their affiliations. Um, so there was always fraternity and sorority paraphernalia around my house. So I always kind of knew I would at least want to be Greek or at least pursue it. Uh, so when I began my college search, I was... Um, looking at all over, but strictly schools with Greek life, um, kind of looked at the Citadel and then said, no, there's no Greek life. No way am I going there. Um, <laughs> and also I didn't have any interest in a military college. Um, right. uh, well, as, uh, but ultimate respect for the guys there. Um, and then when I got to college, I began rushing and, um, I was fortunate since I grew up in the um, realm, I knew that it was more than just a party. Um, and I knew that Animal House, that's a great film, but there's obviously more to it. Um, but it's it's easy for that stereotype to fall in place because in right. college, students are going to drink and um, Greek life tends to be the social hub. So it's what people know it for. Um, so I already overcame that hurdle, but um, just getting to know the guys outside of the house, um, whether it was sitting down with them at lunch or um, seeing them in the gym or whatever it may be, um, and realizing that uh, they have this really tight bond with one another um, mm -hmm. and that they actively pursue leadership and the betterment of their affiliation, uh, I thought it was something really neat. And then also just the history of Greek life. Um, it's a tradition that dates back to the 19th century. Um, men and women have been forming together and uh, bonding in these rituals, and I thought um, it would be really neat to witness that, be a part of uh, a living history. For sure. And you mentioned that your dad was actually a part of Greek life when he was back in school. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was the pressure like to join the fraternity he went to <laughs> versus going to Pike Row? <laughs> Uh, very intense. <laughs> so, uh, he has three boys and we all went Greek. Uh, none of us went to his house. Um, and I, and I'm the youngest, so I was his final hope. So, um, the first time he came down to visit, he went to the Sigma Chi house and he just, Oh, Hey, Hey brothers. Hey brothers. This is my son, Bobby. He's a legacy and he's rushing. Who's your rush chairman? Bobby, go get his number. Bob, Bobby's a, a good guy. And I was just like, Oh, it was the most embarrassing thing. Yeah. Um, and then I remember I called my dad before I, uh, began pledging. I was like, dad, I, I think I'm going to pledge. And, and he asked with so much anticipation, like, all right, which house? <laughs> and when he found out it wasn't his, he he just said, "All right, I'm happy you're in the system, but you didn't join the best." I was like, oh, "All right, yeah. Dad." Yeah, so but a but lot least, of pressure. But at least you're in Greek life, and he's cool with that, and that's yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, he, he's come around to the idea. Yeah. Well, so I hear of this notion of the the lifetime commitment that when you join a fraternity, you know, you this is a brotherhood, and it isn't something mm -hmm. that just ends after four years in school. Uh, it goes well into the workforce and and uh, the alumni connections and uh, and stuff like that. Do you do you view it that way? Is it a lifetime commitment for you? I do. Yeah. So so it the but one of the best ways it was described to me is it's um, a lifelong commitment that begins in college. Uh, so as you're kind of forming into the adult you aspire to be uh, when you're first entering college and you're seeing uh, what you value and who you right. value. Uh, or whom rather, um, you, you begin to um, form that commitment. And then once you graduate, I think it's even stronger. You have the responsibility of ensuring that the younger guys 
uh, are going to preserve it, that the younger guys are going to appreciate it and do the right thing. And there's alumni chapters, guys that uh, gather. Um, so, of, of course, the connections are a thing, but I think it's a lot more than that. I think it's just um, simple fellowship, uh, understanding that if a brother, no matter when he was a brother, um, approaches you, you treat him um, as a brother and you give him kind feeling and mm. uh, sympathize with him. And I think it's really neat when you see it. We just had initiation and one of our brothers, his grandfather was a brother, class of 1959. Whoa. And he came to his initiation um, and it's so, so yeah, it's just a constant giving back and understanding that what you've experienced, um, the 200,000, 300,000, whoever, however many your fraternity has right. have gone through this similar experience and you have that mutual bond. So right. way more than just four years in my opinion. Yeah. I and mean, one of the stats I saw was that in the U S alone, or it might've been just North America actually, um, in general, uh, there are over 6,000 fraternity chapters and wow. uh, as far as Pike goes, there are over 280,000 initiates. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's a good time to kind of break down some of this terminology. Because, again, we watch these movies like Old School and Animal House, and we think we know the, vo the vocabulary and, uh, you know, things like rush, pledge, uh, initiation. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can kind of start with that and break down some of that, some of that lore. Uh, sure. So, so, so you have your fraternity and then you have your nationwide chapters. Is that right? Uh, the, there's the national fraternity and then at different schools, those are the chapters of. Gotcha. And so for instance, there at Hamden, Sydney, you're the IOTA chapter of Pike. We are. Uh, okay. so the way we count it is that our first chapter at UVA is alpha. Our second at, uh, Davidson is, uh, beta and it goes on and on like that. And then, um, so we're the IOTA. So we were the ninth chapter that was formed. Um, and then once we exceed as we're over 200, it starts going alpha, 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 beta. <laughs> and I think we're up to like lambda, omega or something like that. Oh my like goodness. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, so when you when you get to your first uh, semester in college, uh, you hear a lot about rush week. And it's mm -hmm. your opportunity to kind of get familiar with the different fraternities on campus. It's, an op it's also an opportunity for them to get to know you and, and kind of get that, that fit, you know, see if you're, you know, membership material. Uh, mm -hmm. what's that rush week like? And is it different across colleges? Uh, it is. So usually rush is determined by the college. Um, so most will do one week. Um, I've, I've seen some schools that have it very structured on Monday, you go to this house, Tuesday afternoon, you go to this house. Um, at my college, it's one semester long. So first semester freshman can't pledge. Um, and then they have to hit a certain GPA to be allowed to. Um, so it, since it's so long, it's a lot more informal. Mm. Um, we, we have the formal events where we'll, we'll text them and say, hey, we're, um, we're, we're watching the game, we're playing poker, um, we have a mixer with a sorority, whatever it may be. But then there's also just the informal of, um, uh, you, you see them around campus or uh, you want somebody to go play golf with. So mine is, my school has a very informal, but essentially, Right. For the terminology, rush is just the period for brothers to meet those that aspire to be brothers and see if there's a mutual connection. And traditionally, is it on like a compressed schedule? Is that why it's called rush? Or is it, what's, does it feel like a rush? Uh, <laughs> um, no, rush, I loved rush. I mean, <laughs> you, if you're a rush, you get to walk into a fraternity house and everybody loves you. It's awesome. Um, everyone tries to recruit you. Yeah, everyone, That's all of a great. sudden, they're your best friend. So I loved rush. That's awesome. Um, my understanding of where the term came from, um, and this, so I'm in a debate society at my college. And, yeah. uh, but of course, things get lost in history and stories are yeah. told in the telephone game. So perhaps <laughs> this is just... Um, my, I just heard it and it's a conceited view, but apparently we began the rush process by my debate society um, because when freshmen would arrive, the society would, and this was in the 18th century, would uh, sprint and uh, just take guys and say, all right, you're in our society now, and then have them debate. And we thus called it rush and then Greek life stole it. Wow. I don't know so, if that's So they, I don't so know they kind of true. assigned people. Yeah, I know 
for my debate society, the Union yeah. Philanthropic. It's the oldest continual debate society in the country. Um, but it's um, so it used to be a graduation requirement from the college to be a member. Um, so right away, your first day, they'd split you up and try to get the rivalry started. But again, <laughs> uh, I, f- I feel like that was probably an idea in some guy's head in the 40s. And then right. by now, we, we tell everybody, oh, yeah, we, we created Rush. <laughs> <laughs> we started it. Um, yeah. So then you get to college, you do Rush Week, and it's that mm-hmm. process of getting to know the different fraternities and your different options. And I would imagine that for, for a woman, sororities are the same way, right? Um, I imagine. I go okay. to an all-male college, so it's a well, sorority life I'm a little I mean, I mean, uh, unfamiliar I'm, with. Yeah. <laughs> well, that alone is interesting, right? So I think we had mentioned in our last chat that uh, Hamden, Sydney is one of only three colleges that's mm. all-male uh, across the country. So um, is... is uh, is being a part of a, of a brotherhood different uh, because of that? Um, I think so. So, like, since we're all male, we kind of have the brotherhood of the college. So, Greek life here, when I've compared to when I've visited other chapters or gone to see friends at different schools, um, it's a lot more just an extension of the brotherhood. So, gotcha. um, like, a, a brother from Theta Chi or um, Kappa Sig is always welcome to walk into our house and hang out and, and we, and we talk and we, or, or somebody that's not affiliated with Greek life at all. Um, we kind of have that. All right. We're, we're brothers in one way or another, but I've noticed when I've go, gone to other schools, like the, the fraternities don't interact. And this is only some chapter, some schools that, but they don't interact. Or if you're uh, non affiliated, affiliated, you don't go to fraternities. Um, so it's really, uh, interesting. I think being on yeah. all male college just offers um, a secondary brotherhood. Gotcha. So I, I actually didn't know that. So there might be rivalries among the fraternities themselves, depending on which one you belong to or not. I, yeah, I think they're all mostly friendly. Gotcha. Um, okay. Like we'll we'll do like a football game and it gets pretty intense, but then we're all <laughs> laughing about it later. Um, so yeah, l- little rivalries here and there, have, but nothing vicious. Have you ever seen someone join a fraternity or at least be initiated and then jump ship to another one? Does that happen? Um, I don't know of any fraternities that allow previous initiates of a Greek social fraternity as members. Gotcha. Um, okay. So I know that we don't allow it. So if you've been in another fraternity, you can't, uh, or Greek social fraternity. Gotcha. Um, and I can't think of any that do allow it. Gotcha. So well, I think it says something about their commitment, right? Like, you know, yeah. they, they joined a fraternity, you know, they pledge commitment and then they just drop out. Um, mm. So I'd imagine that that's probably not the ideal candidate um, for your for your organization. But uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, kind of building on this whole process. So you get to school, you do rush week. And then, you know, here come the bid cards, the process of inviting folks to be a pledge in that mm-hmm. fraternity. What's what's that process like? And kind of walk us through your experience of being a pledge. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, the, the bid is the offer. And that's determined. Uh, each house will have their own uh, system. We do. If two guys say no, uh, then the person doesn't get a bid. Um, so it has to be... Pr- pretty unanimous in order to get a bid uh, and we'll bring the guys up and we have slideshows and everybody um, will share their opinions say I like the kid because of this and then oh well, I'm worried about this and there's kind of some cross debate and then we vote um, and if they get the offer um, and they accept the offer then they become a pledge and a pledge is um, somebody that's aspiring to become a brother um, and it's a period of time where uh, they're kind of being formed into what is expected of them as a brother. So they're learning about the uh, national history. They're learning about uh, the daily operations of the chapter. Um, they're they're essentially uh, proving that they want to be there and they're ready to make a commitment to themselves and to uh, each other. And they it's mostly learning history and bonding with the house yeah. and gaining an appreciation. Uh, so my, my experience as a pledge, I really liked it. Um, I pledged for eight weeks. Um, I thought it was a great experience. Um, they, um, it, you always hear the stories of, um, you know, a, a guy is, you're, you're going to get beat up or they're going <laughs> to haze you with alcohol 
or um, all, all these things. And I'm of, I mean, it's documented. It has happened, and it's a real shame when it happens because it's not what Greek life ought to be about. Um, and Greek life can offer a lot more so long as you do it properly. So my experience, I um, woke up every day at 7:30, and I would eat breakfast with my pledge brothers, um, and we'd have dinner together every day. We studied for a minimum of three hours every day. Um, we would be cleaning the house and the like, but that was just time for us to be with each other and we, we were learning and it was a really good, busy, stressful time, but um, I don't regret a minute of it. Most of the movies seem to focus on this pledge period, right? When mm -hmm. they're going through this trial period of, of trying to, to show their commitment and devotion to the organization, they go through these different tests. And sometimes, you know, you'll see people dress up in costumes, you yeah. know, do funny and quirky things. Like I think women in sororities will sing or mm -hmm. do door chants and stuff like that. Uh, any kind of funny stories you can kind of look back on? Any any funny situations you were, you were put in? Did you sing? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I sang. My, my buddy, my buddy, my pledge brother, Noah Frazier and I, uh, whenever the pledge, whenever the brothers wanted, we had to sing uh, Bismarcky's Just a Friend. <laughs> and and we would jump up on the bar and start singing it and um, we, we had to give dances to sorority girls and um, so, so like that with, with all like the beneficial stuff there's also like really silly stuff that at the time when you're applied you're like why am I doing this this is the dumbest thing why am I um, carrying around a piece of wood um, we always have a plank um, or or <laughs> Uh, from Ed, Ed and Eddie or, or, or all this stuff. But then you realize, like, especially now I'm a senior and uh, whenever just a friend comes on, I'm running over to my buddy and we're bonding, hanging out, laughing about it. Um, so, so it's a really neat time to um, be a little silly, but you're making memories. Um, and I do think there's a bit of a thin line that from being silly and humiliating someone. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so, so I think it's always good to be cognizant of, all right, is this something he's going to look back on and laugh or say, why the hell did I do that? <laughs> um, and I, I'm happy to say there's nothing I, um, I look back and refuse that I ever did, uh, but a lot, a lot of silly, fun memories. So uh, with the IOTA chapter there uh, at Hamden Sydney College, how big is your pledge class? Let's just take like this most recent semester. Uh, the most recent, we had eight guys. So eight we, guys. Okay. we keep it pretty small um okay. yeah and uh of these eight people just historically do most end up you know being initiated is there a second boat that happens at the end of this pledge period uh that yeah most end up being initiated um my first time as pledge trainer uh one guy he dropped he just uh it, he it was kind of the first night and uh he wasn't really sure if it was for him and then his mom wasn't quite sure, and so yeah. uh, it was totally respectful, and he still comes to the house, and he just said, hey, uh, not not for me. I think I'm going to pursue my interest elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, people will drop occasionally, but for the most part, they'll make it through. Yeah. Um, and as Pledge Educator, what's your role in that whole process? Do you, or do you serve as sort of the chapter historian in terms of the – Going all the way back to the 1800s at the establishment of this organization at your at your school, or, or what's your role in that process? Uh, so, yeah, I mean that's part of it. I think essentially the pledge trainer is the guide to brotherhood. So um, he's kind of making sure that they're um, that that they being the pledges are doing everything properly um, and making sure cliques aren't forming, making sure guys aren't sliding by or um, just essentially all I care about as pledge trainer is that they bond and they, and they learn. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't think that there's any need to, a lot of people look at the pledge trainer and say like, Oh, that's the, the drill instructor. He's the one that mans them up and <laughs> all this stuff. And I don't think there's any need. I think so long as they're bonding and learning, it's a good pledge program and it's going yeah. to create, um, safety in the future that the house is secure, that there's the right values based on the house. Um, so, so yeah, uh, that's my central role is to be the guide. And, uh, you know, and teacher. Yeah. And it's, uh, 
I, I just think back, you know, to, you know, to some of our earlier conversations, you know, you talk about, um, you know, I think after you had already been involved with the military, you came back and that's when you joined this organization mm-hmm. in 20, was it 2015? Yes, I pledged 2015. I mean, it must have been a different experience for you having gone through a very rigorous process training wise for the military and kind of being initiated into this organization and, and mm-hmm. gone through that trial period where you had kind of had to prove yourself. Um, any parallels you can kind of draw between the military life and fraternity life? Yeah, I, I think I think the two are pretty similar. Um, I mean, of course, totally different um, goals. And I think that's where all the differences stem from, um, especially if you look at the trans, transformative experience, um, pledging or basic training. Um, basic training is, uh, and rightfully so, significantly <laughs> more vicious Um <laughs> I, I would not go back to basic, but I would certainly <laughs> go back to pledging. Um, and, but, but I think it, it needs to be because obviously the goal of the military is to make and win war. So, right. um, versus just be good to one another. Um, so t- totally different <laughs> goals. But I think essentially as a soldier in basic training, you're learning and you're um, in a subservient position and you're being introduced to a new world and you kind of learn, okay, I need to um, be a little bit humble and just accept that these guys are going to look after me. And I think the basic trainee does the same thing um, yeah. as, as the pledge. So yeah. just the only difference yeah. is the viciousness. Yeah, no, I, I, I can only imagine, right? But it's, uh, and I think at the same time in the military, you know, you're really, uh, uh, sort of developing this mentality that you're there to serve your, your fellow man and you're there to serve mm-hmm. your country. Um, as a brother in the IOTA chapter for Pike, you know, what's just give me some background as to, you know, what you do, what you guys do in the community, uh, how you stay involved and, uh, and kind of contribute to your local society there. Yeah. Um, so, so the community service aspect of fraternities is amazing and sororities for that matter. Um, so a few things that we do, uh, we have what's called faces. It's a food pantry here in town. So, uh, on weekends, we'll, um, not every weekend, uh, to be totally <laughs> honest. I, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't think anyone would expect you to do it every weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but occasion, probably once a month or so we, we go and we will invite a sorority and we'll have a little mixer early in the morning. Um, and just, uh, give out food. We also have adopt a highway that uh, will go and will clean up, make sure that uh, the the road is um, preserved and the like, uh, and that the nature's clean. Um, and then there's also even larger scales than that. If it's something as simple as a, a fo- do- donations and raising money for a cause, or this past year with um, all the weather in Texas, we sent a brother down to help right. give out some food and clothes. So I, th- I think it's really neat, and the national fraternity always has opportunities, um, and th- there's a lot of good that comes from it. And that was one of the things I did as a pledge and that I have the pledges do um, so that they can learn um, empathy, or, or sympathy rather, sympathy and um, care for their community and kind of see that um, right now things aren't so bad and they can always help out. Um, so, uh, yeah, the community service is a fantastic aspect of Greek life. Well, you know, I, I just think back to the beginning of this whole notion of the fraternity and what it was what it was meant to do and meant to be, which was to serve those social, academic and professional interests and those communal interests of its members and where they are. Uh, has that drifted at all over the last, you know, several years, uh, you know, with this? kind of glamorization of, of the partying and the booze mm-hmm. or, or does it just come back to what college you're at and which chapter you're with? Um, I think that's certainly part of it and also what time you're with it. Cause I mean, one chapter could be uh, great in the early two thousands, but students are only here for four, four years. So a house can change very quickly. Um, so they can come back in 2010 and all of a sudden totally different house. Uh, hopefully right. not, but it can happen. Um, so in terms of the founders, I mean, most fraternities were founded in the 19th century, um, mid 1800s typically, um, excuse me. And, um, I, like if you look at, um, a lot of the 
foundings. They were literary societies, uh, guys that met and read poetry or um, studied together um, and or, and things like this. So uh, I think that the notion that they kind of became these social secret organizations and most have left the literary behind uh, is um, – certainly a change um, and those like Pike that formed simply on the basis of fellowship um, I, I think certainly there is uh, there is that fellowship but I do think that debauchery uh, has hindered the mission of Greek social fraternities uh, and not not to say um, you're a bad brother if you're gonna uh, right. go to the tailgate obviously as you know <laughs> and, uh, and and have a few too many cocktails and um, enjoy yourself. I don't think that's um, it should be outlawed, but I think that there needs to be an understanding of what you're a part of, and that it can be a lot more. Um, and I think if you're focused solely on the debauchery, solely on the um, on the coeds, solely on uh, the hazing aspect, um, then yes, the mission's being failed. But I also think that with Greek life in its current state, which is pretty fragile because of all the um, recent um, discoveries, I suppose, right. I think it's it sparked a wide revolution that something needs to be done. And we need to realize that in order for this to be something that our children and grandchildren can be a part of, like our grandfathers and grandmothers were, uh, right. it, it needs to have that um, better focus on it. Yeah, and, and, and you're absolutely right as far as those recent discoveries and what's been kind of happening around campuses across the country. Um, we, we've talked about, you know, Timothy Piazza at Penn mm-hmm. State. You know, last year he was a 19-year-old sophomore, went to a pledge event and, uh, you know, unfortunately died from several injuries sustained during that event, fell yeah. down the stairs. Nobody called an ambulance to help him, hit his head on railings. Um, you know, I mean, there were other things that were going on too. He had he was on antidepressants, you know, while he was drinking alcohol and mm-hmm. they had them going through this rigorous, you know, I think they call it the gauntlet where you drink from a bottle of vodka, you drink a can of beer and then you move on to wine. And it's just this alcohol infused pledge event that probably isn't unique to Penn State, but, um, you know, it, it happened. And unfortunately, in the morning hours of the next day, you know, they pronounced him, I think they pronounced him dead at a local hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just to kind of, you know, piggyback on what you're talking about is, you know, these things do happen. And, you know, some fraternities, some chapters do take it too far. Um, you know, it, it, it sucks. And, and, you know, for a few reasons that, you mm-hmm. know, uh, it highlights, you know, fraternities as being this like, you know, club of debauchery and, and place where people just go to, you know, have unprotected sex and, you know, to, to engage in underage drinking when it's not the case mm-hmm. for every single fraternity out there. But unfortunately it paints that brush, right? Especially when it's on CBS and ABC across the, yeah. across the nation. Um, so, so I hear you there and, uh, and, and, and those incidents, you know, are unfortunate, but I think it's, it's pretty awesome, man, that you can kind of sit here and, um, and we can have this discussion mm-hmm. of, of those unfortunate events and, uh, and, and what does happen across the country. So, um, kudos to you, man, you know, for kind of being open to that discussion. You know, I, I know that just in my brief research on this subject, there are a lot of chapters out there who, who frown upon committing, uh, to interviews like this and talking about Greek life and going public with it. Um, so it's pretty cool that, that you can kind of sit in that chair and, and have this discussion, man. So I, you know, I appreciate that. And. I, I guess to, to, to kind of wrap up, you know, that, that piece of it is, have you met anyone in Greek life who, you know, uh, has gone against kind of speaking about it publicly? Um, I, I think, I, I think a lot of times it's not, not that, um, the discussion shouldn't happen. I think, I think it's very important to happen. Um, and although, yes, I think, um, the cases like at Penn State, um, aren't as widespread, at least I hope they aren't. Uh, I think it's very good that we make them aware uh, because in no um, part of what uh, the intentions of Greek life are is that something that um, should be condoned. So I, I think it's a good thing to have it pointed out and have people refocus their priorities and their values and understand that um, that uh, is a tragedy and shouldn't have happened. I, I think where the don't speak out 
um, is more so if it's your chapter, and that's just a uh, like a legal safety. Um, is hey, don't let, let's talk to the lawyers. Let's get the national fraternity. Um, yeah. The kind of self-incrimination. Uh, I don't think people mind um, discussion of what Greek life um, can be, what it to me is, um, and what it ought and should be. So, so I think um, talking about Greek life isn't really frowned upon unless it's the the secret stuff, uh, initiations and the like. Gotcha. Um, but, but yeah, I think I think uh, everything would be all right with what I'm saying. I hope so. But <laughs> if not, I, I suppose I'll take the challenge. <laughs> you take the paddle, bro. Come on, I've seen you. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I'm just I'm just joking. But uh, you know, uh, but on this notion of speaking out, you know. Uh, Penn State, I think in the last week or so, is is starting to introduce legislative uh, language around uh, like an amnesty provision for mm-hmm. folks who are at a pledge event or at a party. They see someone you know involved in underage drinking uh, or anybody for that matter who needs immediate medical attention. Right? The average person would say, "Okay, I know that we should probably call the police or the ambulance, but I don't want to get everybody in trouble. I certainly don't want to get myself in trouble uh, mm-hmm. by calling in the authorities." Uh, when we know this this should not be happening um so the 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 state of pennsylvania is introducing some language to provide some kind of amnesty provision for somebody who yeah. calls the ambulance uh you know when they're seeking immediate medical attention i i thought that was pretty cool and and just you know in my four years going to college you know i, I wasn't involved in greek life but uh i heard that time and time again you know people were very very cautious about you know when to call an ambulance because they just didn't want to get in trouble. I mean, have you wow. have you heard those kind of stories? Um, so I'm also a member of the student court, and uh, the student court at Hamden Sydney tries all um, violations of honor and code of conduct. And one of the things of code of conduct is um, alcohol abuse, uh, specifically if you're underage. And but we do have a medical amnesty. Um, and to my knowledge, at least in my existence, it's always been there. So I haven't really seen a fear. Um, and I know if freshmen are drinking too much, they're hanging out in their dorm room, um, n- not not aware of their own limits, essentially. Um, it, uh, sometimes mistakes will be made and somebody needs to go to a hospital. And I think that the medical amnesty has done a fantastic job because it allows guys to uh, go right to their RA and say, all right, um, so-and-so's uh, passed out, we need to do something, and they're able to get them help rather than try to cover anything up. Um, now, personally, I think getting in trouble is um, far less less um, than saving a guy, so I, I think it's kind of silly that people, uh, that it needs to exist, um, but I'm happy it does nonetheless. Right. Is, is there in your mind an ideal candidate for Greek life? Is there somebody that you see that kind of really has those ideals or mentality to kind of fit well with that brotherhood? Um, hmm. I mean, I, I don't think there's one ideal guy. Uh, I mean, there, a lot of it depends where you go to school, what the Greek culture is like there. Um, uh, and then within that, what are the houses like? Cause each house is going to have its own personality. Um, so uh, I think that the ideal candidate is just somebody that, um, is open-minded to the idea of Greek life and is willing to be themselves. And if they as themselves are liked by someone, by another house, um, and they are offered a bid, I think in that organization, they're ideal. Um, for my specific chapter, I, I just we we look for uh, scholars, leaders, athletes, and gentlemen. That's our our tagline. So we want to have somebody that's focused on uh, essentially mind, body, spirit, there, and, and a leader in their community. Somebody that's taking um, that that isn't just following. That's establishing things. Someone that wants to make something of themselves and better their community. So I, I think that's what we look for. But I think anyone could be an ideal candidate you mentioned the fraternity house so do do you (laughs) so you know again going back to the movies Uh, do do you do you get to live in the house once you're initiated you can't to live in it um so i've never had interest in living in the fraternity house (laughs) Um, so 
Every time it's been offered to me, um, I turn it down right away. I don't want to <laughs> walk outside of my room and and like the floor is sticky and there's another broken oh. window and um, <laughs> and people playing music at 3 a.m. That just seems um, uh, <laughs> I have no interest, but guys that do uh, have interest, um, each individual chapter uh, will have kind of their own priorities. So, all right, we need to have the president live in the house. Um, we need to have this guy live in the house. The treasurer needs to be in the, obviously the house manager, um, which is a really tough job. Um, <laughs> it should be in the house. And um, and then other than that, it'll be, um, we, we do it based on uh, seniority. So if a senior wants to live in the house over a freshman, then he'll get it. Um, we house 11 guys in my house, but yeah, I have no interest so, in it. And so over the years, so these are all off campus, right? Like fraternity row as it's traditionally called, I, I don't know if that exists at Hamden and Sydney, but these are always off campus, right? Off campus houses and they change throughout the years. Like when's the um, last time you guys switched homes? So, so most are on campus actually. Um, oh, wow. And actually, for Hamden City purposes, every single house is on campus. Um, but a few houses have an additional off-campus house, um, <laughs> which is always funny. Our VCU chapter, Virginia Commonwealth University, they have like four houses or something. It's oh, crazy. my goodness. Yeah. Who owns um, these houses? I have no idea. Uh, I just, like, <laughs> I, I go up to visit, and I'll text a friend, and... I'll say like, "Hey, I'm at the house." He's like, "Oh yeah, which one?" Jeez, oh, oh, <laughs> hopefully, one? hopefully the right one. I don't know. That house one yeah. A. Yeah. yeah, we we just have the one. Yeah. Um, but uh, and oh, yeah. so, so the and last so, time, and so, and so yeah, yeah, I'm curious, like how often you 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 know transition homes? I'm curious. Mm, so we um, we've been in the same home since 1992. It had a renovation in 2001. Um, I hope I have those dates right. I should have them right. Uh, so we've had five houses throughout our history. Um, and fraternities, um, and that, that kind of goes back to a previous question. Um, fraternities haven't always had houses. Um, the first fraternity was Chi-Fi uh, in 1824. And it wasn't until 18, I want to say 57, that Beta Theta Pi um, got the idea that, oh, hey, we should live together. Um, and that was at Hamden, Sydney. And um, all of a sudden they had a house and everyone in North North America was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll get houses, too. And now it's kind of the stereotype because it, it is amazing. We have pretty humble houses here because it's a small college. But if you go to a like a large D1 school, it, it's absurd that the houses are <laughs> sometimes bigger than the academic buildings. And I don't know where they're getting it, but um, it's it's really neat, the, the houses. But. Ours is pretty modest. And uh, and as a member, do you contribute like uh, semester dues or annual dues towards that house and towards the organization? And do you have to pay more if you decide to live in the house? H how does that work out? Uh, yeah, so there's um, semester dues, um, and it varies from chapter to chapter based on the chapter's needs and um, and what the guys collectively agree upon. Uh, and that money goes towards... Um, things like uh, insurance for the house, scholarships for brothers, um, national recognition dues, and then the, those go into different programs like um, ev every year we have convention and there's also what we call Pike University and that's a, um, a time for, all right, this is how we're going to bring back brothers from all generations and you're going to learn um, how to network in business. You're going to learn how to um, dress properly. You're going to learn how to invest. You're going to learn how to um, essentially be an adult um, right. and be be a man of Pi Kappa Alpha. So that's what the money goes towards. Mm -hmm. um, and then if for us, and I imagine this is how most would work, if you live in the house, you pay additional, you pay for what you would for a room and board. Um, gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, just historically speaking, I, I have heard of, of – a lot of chapters who do have houses, you know, on or off campus, that they carry a lot of insurance, you know, because you know your floor <laughs> might fall out or, uh, you know, that happened to us. There, there was so so. Tell me about that experience. I mean, how the hell does that happen? <laughs> so so we have um, we have our house, and then uh, there's what's called the bunker, and we have a deck, and it's it's great. We'll put um, a band on the deck, and people hang out on the deck, and the bunkers 
kind of like a glorified garage um, uh, with finished walls and everything, but it has cement um, floors and, well, now all cement. Uh, we had one section that was wood, and below it was, uh, in the basement, lived a brother. And it was, it was a few months in, and all of a sudden he's realizing that the ceiling's leaking a bit. So he puts up some buckets, and we, we were doing just um, as, as odd and um, impromptu uh, fixing that we could throughout the semester. And then all of a sudden we come in, and the floor's collapsed, and it's, it's now in the guy's room and we said well we need to fix this um fortunately the um the college well in this case fortunate sometimes it's unfortunate but the college owns our house um so they were able to get us a new floor over winter break and we came back and um, our house was repaired <laughs> so but how it happened i don't know i imagine Dude. just decades of uh of people jump in people uh spilling things i, I mean um, do you guys have like a, yeah. a, a step, a step group? Is that, is that, oh. is that part of Pike? Is that a... It's not part of us. No, but, <laughs> uh, a, few, a few fraternities have that, but no, we don't, we don't have any, um, stomp teams or marching bands. <laughs> What'd you do this weekend? Oh, I just had to repair a floor that fell out of my house. You know, just, uh, too much standing on it. Um, <laughs> too much standing. Yeah. Maybe that was it. We just that stood is... too long. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things I always think about is, uh, you know, because it is, it is the most kind of glamorized, uh, portion of this whole, you know, Greek life is, mm -hmm. is the initiation, the pledging. Um, you know, I, I had read somewhere that, you know, there's a breaking down of a person's individual flaws to kind of build them back up as part of a stronger group, stronger team. Um, Drawing back on your kind of military experience, is that what is that what you saw in the military, and is that what you saw, at least in these few years that you've been in Greek life? I think the military, without a doubt, um, and the because you you go in and you it's a completely new world. You there's customs that you don't know. There's um, you you're told how to walk, how to eat, uh, how to read time. Um, there's rank structure, so it's totally new. So they need to um, just get a clean slate, and they do that through um, a lot of very creative means. Um, <laughs> to to put it a little mysteriously, um, and I think Greek life um, you have to learn a little bit of the culture, but it's not too difficult to grasp. It's not an entire new world, um, so so I don't think there's as much of a need. Um, and I don't, uh, at least again, I'd hope, I, I know in my experiences, um, but it's, it's not so much, all right, you don't know this, we're going to punish you, we're going to um, yell at you, you're going to, uh, you're going to pay for this. It's a lot more of um, kind of a, a development. Okay, hey, this is why you need to do this. You've got this wrong, we're going to fix it, and this is how we're going to fix it. We're going to work with each other, you're going to... And one thing I love to do as pledge trainer, when um, whenever there's one guy that's not grasping a concept, if he doesn't, uh, if he can't remember the preamble or um, know why we were founded, I'll pair him up with um, one of his pledge brothers that he's not too close with, and I'll say, "All right, the two of you, you're going to study together, and you're going to come back tomorrow morning, and you'll know it and know why." And yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's a lot of um, the same camaraderie, but very different paths to get there. Yeah. No, I mean, just piggybacking on that, I was surprised of, of, of how many hours you poured into study hall. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think when you were, when you were pledge, uh, with, with Pike. Um, and I think you had mentioned, uh, in one of our chats at one point that your grades actually went up <laughs> yeah. during your pledge period, which I thought was just baffling. I would have never thought your grades would have improved no, during that pledge nor period. did I, but, but yeah, my, <laughs> um, at, until this past semester, it was my highest GPA I've ever had at the college was when I was pledging. <laughs> and I think it's because they, we were so busy all the time. You know, you're always doing something pledging. And those three, we do minimum of three hours uh, a day. So those three hours I was in study hall, I knew nobody could bother me. I would get some alone time. I could, I could just sit there and study. And if I was studying, I was good. And so... <laughs> 
I, I would look forward to study hall every day. So I was like, yep, yeah, can't, I can't <laughs> clean the house. I got to read Tocqueville. <laughs> So, well, you know, yeah. this, this all really goes back to, you know, why, why join Greek life in the beginning or in the first place? And so when you're 18 years old and you go to college and, uh, you know, obviously your experience having gone through the military first and kind of going back to school was different. But, you know, traditionally you're 18 years old when you show up at Rush Week mm -hmm. and, and you don't know anyone in college and you don't have any friends, your family's far away and you feel kind of lost. And sure, you're an adult at 18 years old, but you're still kind of molding and forming yourself into that yeah. adult that you want to be. Um, and uh, you, you still have a lot of room for, for improvement and for growth. And so I think one of the main reasons that I, I, I seem to think people join Greek life is to, you know, have, have, you know, that mentorship and that camaraderie to help them get from A to B. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just kind of funny how people reflect on their pledge periods about how, it's some of the best and worst times of their lives. That's right a great because, description. Right, because they look back on it and they're like, man, I had to go through that. But guess what? I went through it with this person, with this person, with this person. You know, mm -hmm. I went through it with my brothers and I made it through. So it was a, it was a terrible experience, but I made it through. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, any other challenge or any sort of obstacle you face moving forward, it's, you know, you, you, you carry that mentality of no matter how hard it is, no matter how bad it hurts, you can make it through and, and, and jump over that hurdle. So yeah. I, I think you're, you're very impressionable, I think, at that age, at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly one of, the, one of the knocks that I've heard on Greek life is, well, why would I, you know, go to college and pay dues to have friends? And it's like, well, hey, you know, I mean, like, what is it that you want, right? Do, do you want to be surrounded by people you can count on and people who will be there if you need them? You know, is that what you're looking for in your life? Are you looking for structure? Are you looking for, again, mentorship and guidance? If it's not, you know, or if you already have it, then maybe Greek life isn't for you. But yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily paint the brush and say that anybody who joins a fraternity is doing it for that artificial reason to just be a part of a group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think obviously you guys go through your own initiation process, and I don't think you guys would vote people in who you thought – were, were over the top fake and weren't there for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, so just in general, man, I'm, I'm kind of curious about your thoughts, you know, when you do show up at 18 years old and, and you are kind of impressionable. Um, and, uh, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah. So I, I think it's a, I think everyone should at least if they're, um, at a college with Greek life, um, at least be open-minded to it and say, all right, I'll, I'll go to the rush. I mean, worst case, um, I, I come out and I still don't want to be a part of it. And that, that's fine. I, I, I don't, um, I don't think it's bad to not join Greek life. Um, I, I, have really enjoyed the experience and I think it should be something you look at kind of like running with bowls. Like, if that's you, right. No, yeah. That's right. Like if, if you run, that's, that's awesome. And if you get yeah. enjoyment from it, that that's great. Um, but if you don't run, you don't run. Um, and so, um, in, in terms of the pain for friends, that's always the common criticism for Greek life. Um, and, and to that, I say it's, yes, there are dues, but I can't think of an organization I'm a part of, um, that there aren't dues. Um, if, uh, perhaps a religious organization, um, but, um, and then even, even so, it's not like you were paying the chapter directly. Then I could understand it being a little odd. If you were saying, yeah. um, all right, I'm giving a, uh, $100 um, to you as my brother, and that's and now you're my brother. That would absolutely, I think, would be bizarre and um, worthy of criticism. But the, what the money goes towards is toward the future. It goes toward the development of your guys. It's, it's a further commitment. Um, to each other and I think that's what it's about it's not um, paying for friends but it's paying for the security of future fellowship uh, the dues I pay now is going to help um, the generation uh, that's next and going to help them have the experiences I've had so I very happily pay dues um, and, and the like and I've, I have friends in and out of my Greek organization um, and, but yeah, I think 18, it's an impressionable age, and I think it's a good time to um, 
go into something a little blind. I think one of the best things that a young adult can do is step out of his or her comfort zone and be willing to um, do something different, do something that makes them uncomfortable. Um, Because I think that's where um, true, true learning begins and true appreciation. And I think it's often the person that wasn't sure about Greek life or the guy that hadn't really seen anything but the movies and then came. I think, (laughs) I think a lot of times that person tends to be um, a really good contribution Um, because they, in the army to bring it back to military, some of the best shots, um, I'm an infantryman, so it's all about weaponry. Um, some of the best shots out there are guys that never touched a weapon before because the drill sergeants are able to say, all right, this is exactly what you do. And they instantly don't have any bad habits, um, compared to, yeah, compared to the guy that grew up shooting, he may be used to putting his elbow out or something and trying to change what's natural for him. It's really difficult. So I think a lot of times the the unsure candidate tends to be a good guy. Yeah. No. My uh, my family tried to get me to play the accordion one time, and uh, uh, apparently I, I I I didn't have any previous bad habits, but I just I just suck. So <laughs> so that's where it ended, man. So you won't see me playing accordion anytime soon in Pamplona. Um, no, dude. That, that's, that'd be quite a sight. <laughs> jump, jump with the street bands and play accordion. But, but I haven't tried to do it drunk or on on red wine. So maybe it'll be somewhat different if I if I'm juiced up. Um, we'll have a cognac on chocolate and then yes. jump in. <laughs> dude, can you imagine. Oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, I, I'd be tackled right away. Um, but no, I, I think I think it's interesting this this whole notion of Greek life. Uh, I, I think there is meaning to it. I think again, it's just. Uh, it depends on what school you go to, which chapter you join, yeah. um, maybe even who's in who's in it at the time, right? Because somebody's only in school for an average of four years, so you yeah. have this constant cycle of people mm-hmm. flowing in and out of the organization. So um, it's just very specific uh, to your time. But uh, That's true. if if you had to give like a thirty second to sixty second pitch for folks to join Pike, the IOTA chapter at Hamden, Sydney. Oh, what would you, the thirty seconds I wrote historian, it. or dude? If it takes longer than thirty to sixty seconds, I'll just reset so, my wine. So, proclaimed yeah. historian and house surgeon. Yeah. Um, and, and house surgeon. Oh, dude, I gotta ask you about that. All right, but really quickly, your pitch. What's your pitch? All right, I'm eighteen years old, dude. You're I, eighteen uh, years old. I'm leaving home, dude. I can't grow any facial hair yet. Uh, I love my mama. Oh, in that I case, always love not. my mama. Um, <laughs> how do you get me to join? How how do you attract? How do you attract me? Uh, I, I, th- I think one of the best ways and what I try to do as a brother is um, talk to them outside of the house when because obviously at the house you're going to be um, drinking, there's going to be um, co-eds and um, there's going to be loud music and I don't think you can really have a good conversation. So what I like to do is go down uh, if they're um, eating lunch or something, um, just sit or I see them in the library and sit down and just say, Hey man, how, how did you like last night? And, um, once they get talking, ask them about, um, where are they from? What are they interested in? Kind of see what they do and then say, Oh yeah, our brother, he's also from Raleigh or, Oh cool. So you're on the golf team. You probably know this guy. Um, yeah, I pledged with him, what, whatever. And then making that mutual connection that way, um, they understand, um, that they can bond with the brothers and that um, just because they're brothers, they aren't unapproachable and they can go up and talk and it can be a very comfortable position. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, if you were 18, I would just want to know about you and uh, yeah. try to form some familiarity. That's pretty cool though. Like you would actually, you know, willingly go sit down to somebody you might, you might not know mm-hmm. and just try to relate to them in, in some degree or another. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I'm sure you see that a lot when someone's on campus for the first time, you know, at least when I first started, I'm sure I stuck out like a sore thumb, dude. Um, I, I I told you before, uh, my experience with Greek life was, I was on campus, dude. So I love we the getting, story. We were getting tours of like the different schools on campus, and it was like, all right, political science, business school, uh, you know, liberal, liberal, whatever, liberal arts, and uh, we got to the business school, and they broke us out into different groups, and we would huddle around like four or five of us at a time around these like. <laughs> circular tables and just like talk business mm-hmm. and like what our passions were and what we wanted to be when we grew up when we grew up already 18 but it's uh so in in this in the middle of this like of this little huddle 
I turn to my left and this guy's like, he's like a upperclassman, a junior or senior. He's like, Hey dude, uh, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> I was like, uh, dude, I don't know, man. Like I, <laughs> I just got here. It's like day two. He's like, Hey man, dude, I think you should get on the bus, bro. Get, get on the bus, bro. And I was like, dude, what the hell is this guy talking about? I just flew in from Oregon, which is like 3,000 3, miles away from DC. And here I am like fresh off the plane. This guy is telling me, get on the bus, bro. It's like, dude, I was like, what's on the bus? He's like, dude, you get on the bus. It's going to take you. I was like, where is it going to take me? He's like, dude, you want to party, bro? You like girls, bro? Get on the bus, bro. Bro. And that for me was my introduction to American University's Greek life system. And <laughs> it goes back to what we were saying, man. Like, it just depends on what school you go to, which chapter you're with. But I, that was, dude, after that, I was like, I'm good. But yeah. in the conversations I've had with you, if I, if I, for example, was hemmed in Sydney, I think I would have been a little bit more open to, uh, to that experience. Um, and, and maybe Pike in, in particular. So, um, I hope. Yeah. Well, it's never too late. Uh, Seth Rogen became a brother of Pike last year. No Colonel way. Sanders did as an adult. Yeah, you, dude. It's not are you just serious? for. Yeah, it can be done at any age. Like you join as like a faculty, or like what do you join as? Yeah, some people, uh, some faculty will join. Um, they usually skip the pledge process. Um, <laughs> although I have heard rumor that Beta Theta Pi at my college. I don't know if it's true. Um, as we. We gossip a lot, um, and stories evolve over time. But um, I heard that back in the '80s, a professor pledged a fraternity <laughs> on campus. No like they, way. Yeah, during the '80s, things are, um, oh, to, dude, to my understanding, a lot more. Yeah, <laughs> it was goes. Animal House. Yeah. So apparently, they would like go to his class and just start yelling at him, and <laughs> and he was just like, "Oh, yeah, yes, brother." <laughs> And I would just love to be in a classroom with a professor and have some other students come in and start yelling at them. Oh, that is great. I have dude. no idea if that's true, but I, I think it, I would love for it to be. <laughs> what is this? A B minus? Drop down to give me 20. Drop down. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, just, just have them clean up the house, you know, all the chores. Yeah. Dude, one of the things I wanted to do, I, I was so impressed by the chants and the songs that your <sighs> chapter has. And I would imagine that some of these get passed down from like the mm -hmm. national fraternity of, of Pike. Yeah. But, but in some instances you create your own, right? Uh, we, we have one chant. Yeah. Dude. But the, so, the rest are national songs. So I, like I told you, man, for this one chant alone, mm -hmm. I, I would join the fraternity. <laughs> like just to sing it or chant it once I would join dude. And so I, I got it here, man. Dude, I don't know how we should do this. So we we talked about in the lyrics of this chant, there are some asterisks. Yeah. Should I just should I just avoid the asterisks and just say what's what's in writing? Probably best, yeah. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep it clean. Maybe All in right. Pamplona, I'll reveal. Yes, <laughs> that, that oh. that's not a secret, but I, I okay. it's something I didn't want, and it was in the book I wrote. I, um, I didn't want to be in writing with my name for all of eternity. <laughs> and I think it's probably best if, uh, for, for the sake of this podcast, we do the same. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right, here we go. So I will read this, uh, what's called the Iota chant. I was born on a mountain. I was raised by a bear. I've got a double set of teeth. I've got a triple coat of hair. I've got a, and a, I'm a, I'm a pika by God. Dude, I, I would join just for that chant, dude. <laughs> Just for that chant. Oh my gosh, yeah. dude. It's, it's fun. And like, we'll, we'll chant it at um, all different times at any, uh, we, we have pretty low standards for celebration. Um, anything will excite us and we'll then say, oh, well now we can chant our chant. Um, but, but on a more um, overreaching, I, I think that songs have a really great way of bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, chance as well. I think it's um, for la I guess it, it's it's a primitive um, connection to sing together, um, and uh, so yeah, I, I really like the chance and I have the fraternity songs and we serenade our dream girl every year. So I, I think it's really neat um, to have things like that in um, a Greek organization or any organization or Pamplona for that matter. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, what's cool is like, you know, when you graduate, you can go back in 10 or 15 years. And when you hear these lyrics, you hear these chants, like you, you know, you're a part of it. You know, yeah. It, that's special, man. That's cool. Like, it's I remember handed down. I met a brother from our chapter a few years back and the, he was um, sometime in the 90s and he just goes up to me and goes, hey, were you born on a mountain? <laughs> I certainly was. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> Dude, so now that you mentioned Dream Girl, mm. I, I have to know a little bit more about this. Sure. What is the Dream Girl? Does does the person change every year? How did that get started? Yeah, so um, the so Pi Kappa Alpha nationally and every chapter has one and we also have a national Dream Girl. Um, elects one girl um, to be the Dream Girl. Uh, most fraternities call this the sweetheart. Um, we're the only ones that save Dream Girl, to my knowledge. Um, and the sweetheart of a fraternity is simply a a girl that the brothers um, feel embodies the values of the fraternity, and they truly value her um, as a sister. Um, she's not initiated, at least um, not Pi Kappa Alpha Dream Girl, is not initiated, but certainly celebrated and appreciated. Um, and they they do little things like uh, looking out looking out for us, making sure that we're being uh, good representations of the national fraternity. But also um, they'll help us set up tailgates. They'll help us uh, formulate uh, mixers. They'll help um, j just kind of um, take care of us in general and care for us as we would care for her. Um, and it, it's a really great uh, friendship amongst the dream girl in the house. Uh, and the way it started, um, I think nationally, the first sweetheart was SAE, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, and they were formed 1850-something. I forget exactly when, but some, it's before the Civil War. Um, they were antebellum. And during the Civil War, there was a, again, this is what I've heard. I, I can't yeah. uh, cite it. Um, so it may, may or may not be true. But during the Civil War, there was a legitimate fear that um, every brother would die. And wow. if every brother dies, then their ritual um, and their um, organization wouldn't be able to continue because there's no male to pass it on. Yeah. So they had elected one female and brought her into the brotherhood and said, if that's the case, please pass on um, what we have. Um, and then I think other fraternities started seeing this um, relationship. So the way we elect is um, it's a pretty deliberative process. It's um, it's very much like bid ball for um, one to become a pledge. And there's a lot of argument over who we have. Um, and do the girls get really competitive with it? Like, do they want to be the dream girl? Yes. Um, <laughs> in fact, and we're right now we have Maddie. She's fantastic. Um, and. and uh, she's a sophomore at um, yeah. one of the local colleges, and um, so we'll probably keep her until she's a senior. There's no reason to um, mess with what's a good thing, and she's a fantastic dream girl. We're very um, happy to have her, but there is one girl um, and that is trying to she, – she's going to every brother like, hey, vote me for dream girl. <laughs> I, I'll be the best dream girl, and we're, we all just – no, you won't. You can't do that, and <laughs> – and oddly enough, she has a boyfriend in another fraternity, but she wants to be oh. our dreamer. And I, I keep on telling oh. her there are multiple reasons oh. <laughs> that I don't like this. But she's so, so that's the most competitive I've seen it. Um, but yeah, the brothers compete. It's usually a brother's girlfriend um, that we all really care about. Okay. Um, so, so usually she she happens to be dating somebody or 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 usually. with somebody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't think of when it hasn't been that <laughs> but then again i've only been around for two dream girls yeah um ally and maddie i think it's pretty cool dude ally's gorgeous uh you know um let's see i'm flipping through the, some of the historicals here oh. so there's an image tied to each each dream girl um gosh it's it's an unfortunate i can't show this on the podcast um dude ally yeah ally was beautiful um mm -hmm. Yeah, she's great. Was it? Was it? Is it Doogie and, Dargan from '74? Doogie yeah, Dargan. Yeah, Dougie. Not a Dougie. Whew. She's cute. She's cute. Yeah. Um, so, so. But, but yeah, like yeah. one of the things that so Allie, for instance, when I was yeah. writing uh, the little booklet you're 
uh, looking at. Um, I, I reached out to her and I said, hey, I'm writing this dream girl section. Do you think this sums it up? Um, and she, even though she's now graduated, she instantly, because the, the dream girl is much like the brother. It's a lifelong thing. There, you'll always be the dream girl. Um, and she, she was like, oh, yeah, um, send me the book. I'll, I'll send back some edits and was helping me um, in the formulation of me uh, writing the book. Um, so, so I think that that was really neat to see, but that's just like one of the uh, many things that a dream girl will do. That is awesome. So yeah. even though they're not initiated, they're always kind of connected and, and yeah. there for the fraternity. That's pretty neat, man. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, would, would my, you ever, would you ever bring in a dream girl who's a member of a sorority? Oh yeah. They usually that, are. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Usually, I wasn't sure if that was common. Yeah. Yeah. That that's cause it's, um, kind of like that understanding of, okay, you, you're in the Greek system, you know what this is about. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it usually is. Dude, I'm going to, I'm going to try, cause it looks like you have uh, a song in here for the dream girl. Can I read that out? Is that cool? Uh, sure. Yeah. That, that's all public record. You can find them online and the yeah recordings of our course doing it. So everything that's in this, in the book I wrote is, public knowledge no okay secrets, so, so that was that was in this except right. for the asterisks <laughs> that's actually the which, only time i censored the book which have been uh ever so appropriately highlighted with asterisks um <laughs> so yeah i wasn't sure that was one big thing i, I didn't want to kind of put on blast but is that okay if i show the cover real quick or, or yeah sure yeah. yeah so basically here's the cover of the uh uh history and guide to the brotherhood in the iota chapter of pike this is written uh, by Mr. Bobby George, and I'm sure I'm sure you went through an extensive process to gather the research and findings, mm -hmm. and uh, reach out to people for for different photographs and, and historical pieces. But this is awesome, man! How long did it take you to actually write this? Um, the the writing wasn't so bad. Uh, I did it over winter break, um, and I, I rather enjoy writing. Uh, so I had three weeks where I'd sit down for a few hours, but that the extensive part was the research. And I kind of began that over the summer in my free time, looking at um, old yearbooks of the college was my start. And then um, here, I'll, I'll show it since we're doing video. So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the national fraternity, and these are public as well. Um, so I'm not violating anything. I feel like I'm being initiated here. This is kind of cool. I feel, I feel special right now, man. This is cool. All right. Um, so they, they have publications as well. So I went, I, I've read them, but I pulled out everything I liked. Um, so, so you'll see it I cited in there, but there's the garnet and gold, and this is what every pledge gets, and it's just kind of a explanation of the fraternity, um, our founders, stuff like that. And then uh, when you're initiated, you get an extensive history, the oak. Um, Ooh. Yeah, so, so th those were some fraternity publications I was able to go off of. There were tons of publications in my college. There's a national magazine... Oh, no, everything's falling. Also, I have your book. Um, oh, dude, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, not at man. All. That is um, awesome. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> yeah, it was an awesome book, by the way. And amazing <laughs> illustrations. I, I, dude, uh, thank you, yeah. man. Yeah, thank great you. Book. I, I appreciate that. I, dude, I was floored when you sent me this, uh, this, this history and guide to the Brotherhood because, you know, I, I'm sure it's just like you mentioned, it's publicly available. If somebody wants to go out, whether they're from the university or the college or, or somebody who's just interested in Greek life. I'm sure they can get a synopsis of it at least, but uh, it's just uh, it was just so fascinating to kind of read through the history. I would have never imagined that that uh, that the Greek life were so concerned and enamored with the history of their mm -hmm. chapter and of their fraternity. Yeah, and I mean, I I've always really liked um, history, especially of um, organizations and why people were compelled to do things um, and. So, so I wrote the book because um, my chapter is pretty, pretty known. Uh, so the national fraternity had completely uh, failed. Um, their alumni had stopped doing it. And this was only uh, within about two uh, decades of our national founding. Uh, chapters were closing across the country. Um, alumni were uninvolved. We didn't have a national publication. Now, now we, and from that point, we've had the Shield and Diamond, which is our magazine, which is where I got a lot of the information. Um, and and we were essentially there was no way we were going to last um, as a fraternity. And the guys at my chapter, 
called a national convention, um, which only three chapters showed up to. And in that night, they rewrote uh, the constitution. Well, they kept the constitution, but they've added to it. And they said, this is how we're going to become a national fraternity. And they established alumni chapters. They reorganized um, where nationals would be and what the national fraternity would do. Um, and they, they really made it into what it is today. Um, wow. And, and it, was, it was always referenced in the books and the like, but uh, I kind of felt like there needed to be um, a book just for that, not just the, a chapter in the national publication or something like that. So uh, I just started pulling from every source I could, and it, it was really fun. And uh, yeah. now we're handing them out to every pledge that comes in. Makes it a lot easier for them too. <laughs> oh, I know. I bet everything's in one spot, right? And, yeah. and as far as legacy goes, this is your name, man. This is your name. I got to show the photo. This is great, oh, dude. Because you don't, you don't, you really have this stash anymore. Dude, I don't know how you guys did these photos because it looks like they were all shot in the 70s, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty. I don't know if you can see that. Can you guys see that? I don't know if you can see that. On camera. Uh, it's a little tough to see, but yeah, I, uh, I, I, thought, I thought it'd be funny um, since I was a pledge educator. And, you know, it's always fun to look at the old photos of the guys. And I thought, oh, I should have a mustache. It was so good, man. Oh, it, it's way more. I was... Um, at the time, my, my, my girlfriend, um, her father was a brother. I'm not from my chapter, but uh, I, was, I very much wanted to meet him. So I invited him to Greek Week. We had a golf tournament for brothers, and I thought this is the best way to meet a girlfriend's father. Um, and it, it was. He was fantastic. But composite photos were two days afterwards, so I had to keep the mustache and oh my I felt goodness. so I was so embarrassed just going up and saying hi, hi sir nice to meet you and I have this huge <laughs> mustache on my face <laughs> but, I mean now, now I have a photo so I, I kind of feel like you have to bring that back I think we talked about this you got to bring it back to Pamplona I think I might I'm, I'm you should I'm think about it yeah, yeah. at but, least roll a dice like you know maybe um, I'll blend in a little bit more yeah <laughs> No, dude. Uh, this this guide is awesome. I'm glad that it's available for folks to kind of digest. Uh, whether you're a pledge or somebody just interested in learning more about Greek life, uh, and dude, yeah. Before we close the the book, literally, um, on on the on the guide here, mm -hmm. I gotta flip back to this Dream Girl song. I gotta go back. Oh, to that. sure. What page is that on? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I think it's towards the end. That'll be page thirty. Ah, got it. All right. Here we go. So this is called The Dream Girl of Pi Kappa Alpha. The Dream Girl of Pi Kappa Alpha is the dream girl... Is the dream... Son of a girl. bitch. Girl. It's this not. This is what not. happens, ladies and gentlemen, when uh, <laughs> when when you're like two-thirds of the bottle down. Is that, on, a, uh, is that a matador on the front? No, okay. I thought that, I thought that was... Kids. It looked It looked like a bowl and... I really can't tell. I don't know. It looks like a person. Oh, it looks like an angel it's, now. Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. it's, an, yeah, it's an angel. Uh, this is uh, Javier San Pedro. It's white wine from Rioja. It's, it's really good. I, I'm not usually a white wine drinker, but I mm. saw it at a store recently, and I saw it. I thought, you know, what the hell. But Oh, dude, what do you got? That looks better than what I'm drinking. Um, I'm actually re really into it recently. Um, so Dave Matthews, um, if uh, I'm a huge fan of Dave Matthews. Oh, yeah. Band. Um, Matthews Band. He's, he's awesome. And he has his own uh, vineyard in Charlottesville, Whoa. not too far from me. And uh, it's called The Dreaming Tree, which is oh, one of my dude. favorite songs of his. And yeah. every single bottle is named after one of his songs. Um, so this is Crush, um, which is the California Red that I've been, I've been getting a lot. It's really good. And I'm typically, uh, I typically like whites and not, not so much red. So we're a little oh, swapped. Really? But yeah. This is a great great wine so i've been having this um i gotta try that is that is that available to to, to purchase at like a trader joe's or oh like yeah a, a i get store? it at food line okay um, so so yeah you can yeah. uh and yeah it's actually a really great bottle i bought it at first just because it was dave matthews and i thought Dude, he's yeah. so good man Dude, i don't know about you but like all those 90s jams like uh by the oh. google dolls and like matchbox 20 oh, they're oh so yeah good. Dude. whenever i'm driving yeah. uh, i'll just Go go on to Pandora and do like Blink One Eighty Two or like grunge, and it, it's the best music to just sit and drive to. <laughs> like, 
I love it, dude. Yeah. Dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this again. Oh yeah, I'm gonna sorry. Try this sorry, again. We keep getting distracted. No, 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 no. This is this is this is all good. I, I I'm sure I'll still screw it up, dude. This is what happens when you're drinking Rioja, dude. This is uh. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is called the Dream Girl of Pi Cap Alpha. The Dream Girl of Pi Cap Alpha is the Dream Girl I'll always adore. She's enchanting as starlight, and oh how I long to be the lucky one boy to whom she'll belong. The Dream Girl of Pi Kappa Alpha is the ideal of all that I love. We put our hearts in the game, but whose heart will she claim? Will the Pi Kappa Alpha Dream Girl be mine? And that is it. That's it. Dude, that is that is freaking brilliant. I love it. I'm yeah. serious, man. I, I would join just for, for these songs. But that chant is... I gotta do the chant again. <laughs> I was born on a mountain. I was raised by a bear. I've got a double set of teeth. i got a triple coat of hair. I've got a... And a... I'm a I'm a pocket bike god. I really want to sound out those asterisks, but I can't. And and Pamplona. And pa- yeah, dude, in Pamplona, dude, you should, dude, you gotta own that in Pamplona. Uh, 